Welcome to McGuire's Car Crazy. It doesn't matter if you're a guy or gal, if you love cars, you're a car guy. And this is Car Crazy Central shouting the passion that 30 million of us who are car guys across America and tens of millions more around the world share in common, no matter what kind of cars we love. Join us as we focus on this emotion of being car crazy. Welcome to Car Crazy Central, ground zero for monitoring the major events and personalities of the car hobby around the world. Each week we creatively serve up a full menu of Car Crazy passion for you to enjoy via our Car Crazy television and radio shows, as well as on demand through our website, carcrazycentral.com. Our mission is pure and simple, that's right, we want to make you just a little more it was a revelation. I mean, people had never seen this sort of thing going on before, where you sat in one place, the cars came around several times, you saw the cars traveling at these amazing speeds, because of course they're much faster on concrete. In the clubhouse, where we've been earlier on, uh, they actually had a set of weighing scales where they pushed the entire car and the driver yep. onto the weighing scales, and that's how they worked out the handicaps for early motor racing. In the beginning, of course, nobody thought that women would be interested in, yeah. in motor cars at all. Yeah. But the ladies wanted to get stuck in pretty quickly. They they wanted to play. And now our host, Barry McGuire. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another very special edition of McGuire's Car Crazy. Coming today from, what are you, about 25 miles southwest of London. That's, that's right, Barry. Yeah. Alan Wynn, who is the director of the Brooklyn's Museum Trust. Yeah. This is where the Brooklyn's track was. It was the first purpose-built racing circuit in the world. Let's world. talk about racing before yeah. 1906 in Brooklyn. What, what well, kind sure. of racing was going on? Certainly in Europe, it was all about racing between towns and cities on the public highway. Uh, that was okay on continental Europe. Lots of people killed, huge accidents, That's all true. that sort of thing. The story. Um, but in the UK, it was illegal to race on the public roads, so nobody could. You could yeah. go and race in the Isle of Man and places like yeah. that. But in mainland UK, you couldn't. Wealthy local landowner here, Hugh Lock King. And his wife. Ethel. Ethel. We've got to be talking yeah, about yeah, Ethel yeah, here, yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> well, even more so. Yeah. <laughs> well, they went off to watch some motor racing in Europe in 1905 and discovered there were just no British cars taking part. And, and again, this was on the streets. Yeah. So this yeah. wasn't circuit racing. No, no, no circuit no, racing. No, I just, just want to be sure everybody understands. Distance. Understand, this is, this is great history here, really. Mm. It's fantastic. And uh, they discovered no British cars racing. Why not? Because there was nowhere for British manufacturers to develop racing cars. Mm. So Hugh Lock King and a few of his friends said, yeah, why don't we build somewhere where they can develop fast cars? And it went on from there to say, why not just, instead of just developing the cars, let's race them there as well. Hugh was the nominal landowner um, and he owned thousands and thousands of acres of farmland in Surrey and neighbouring things. Ethel came from a wealthy family, which was very important later on, because yes. what happened was that Hugh rather overspent the budget. Um, <laughs> By just a scotch. Uh, just, just a little bit. Um, in round terms, uh, in today's money, he spent about $20 million building this place. And uh, that was far too much. Unfortunately, Ethel and her family were pretty rich. And so she was able to come to the rescue and make sure that the track was opened on time and that everything worked. Yeah. She was such a powerhouse behind this track, and then kind of following in all that legacy, there's a lot of lady car guy drivers here. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, it was interesting. In the beginning, of course, nobody thought that women would be interested in yeah. motor cars at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the ladies wanted to get stuck in pretty quickly. They, they wanted to play. In the 1920s, they started organizing women-only races here, and they were pretty successful, but then... <laughs> the women started pointing out that they were going just as quick as the blokes. And so it took a long time, uh, but by the early 1930s, ladies were racing against the guys on equal footing and often winning races against them. Now, they had this room that was a special, like, uh, yeah, they had holding own, room for the lady drivers they where they could relax. Little, and... Their own little lounge, uh, and we've restored that lounge. Um, and it's all done up as a, as a tribute to those lady racing drivers. We've got lots of photographs, lots of memorabilia from them in that room. That, that's, that is fantastic. It really is. Now, let's go back. It's, that was like two years before Indianapolis. It, We're talking, oh, Indian, India is a pretty famous place. Yeah, it's, but it was so it far was. in advance of Indianapolis that the directors right. of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway had time to come over here and ah. see Brooklyn's working before they commissioned wow. the building of their new track. This is the first racing circuit. 
yeah. the concept of all that really came from horse racing, right? Well, the trouble was, when they started, they, they got this big circuit laid out and no rules on how to run racing on it. You see? So they, they looked around and said, well, we can't just use the rules of head off from Paris and go to Vienna. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't work, does it? Yeah. Imagine, see, they're never being done before and trying to think, how do we do it? And what do we call this? And, you yeah. know, what, so so the what whole they, rules of they started right here. This is, this is <laughs> so what they amazing. Did, um, they were all used to horse racing and so they borrowed all the rules from horse racing from the, from the jockey club uh, in Britain. So, um, and they did it in all sorts of ways, um, you know, outside the clubhouse, uh, where the cars were assembled before the race, became the paddock, because that's what you have in horse racing. Right, uh, to this day, it's the paddock. Uh, absolutely, they appointed a clerk <laughs> of the course to, uh, to look after the racing, just as you have um, at the Kentucky Derby or wherever. Um, then they said, how are we going to identify the, the cars and their drivers? Yeah. So all the yeah. drivers wore coloured racing silks, just, just like you do in horse racing. They came up with numbers after a while. Yeah. But, uh, but and, first it was colours. Yeah, and, <laughs> and in the clubhouse where we've been earlier on, uh, they actually had a set of weighing scales where they pushed the entire car and the driver yeah. onto the weighing scales, and that's how they worked out the handicaps for early this, motor racing. Something. You know, I want to go back to those early days racing on this incredibly banked track. I mean, it was a wild, wild experience. you got some great stories. We're going to hear about that and a whole lot more <laughs> right after this break. Welcome back to McGuire's Car Crazy. Have a lot of fun with Alan Wynn. It is the Brooklyn's Museum, site of the original Brooklyn's track, just this wonderful facility. And I want to go back to those early days. Tell us what it was like racing these old cars on this incredibly banked track. I mean, it had to be wild watching these races. It, it certainly had to be because, again, people just hadn't been racing uh, the sort of cars that eventually ended up racing here. So people started making special cars just to race here. And uh, especially after the First World War, they suddenly discovered there's all these big aeroplane engines lying around. <laughs> and you can take a big aeroplane engine and put it in a touring car chassis. <laughs> they're almost make, flying as they're yeah, going. And in. make something really powerful and very, very quick. And uh, you, you will have heard of things like Fleming's great Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, of right, course. And right. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang was based on Count Zabrowski's first big airship engine racing car here, Chitty Bang Bang. 21 litre, six cylinder uh, German airship engine. Wow. And he started a real trend here. And then everybody else started getting hold of surplus World War I aero engines, <laughs> chucking them into big chain drive motor cars and going racing. Very dangerous um, and not really good. No brakes, but fantastically fast cars, and that's where these great things like the Napier Railton have got their genesis. <laughs> I think we need to call this Car Crazy Central. <laughs> I mean, this is car crazy, is it not? I mean, it's wild, it really is. This place was the first place in the world where somebody actually did 100 miles in an hour in a car. Percy really? Lambert, 1913. Really? actually did the complete 100 miles. He, he did 100 miles. In fact, he did about 103 miles inside an hour. And that was just the first time it had been ever done anywhere. I mean, people had gone faster for a mile, but nobody had ever done a whole 100 miles. And he was the first person to do it. Right. The great history, the great drivers, Sir Malcolm Campbell. The Americans know who Sir Malcolm Campbell is from all the land speed records that were challenged and broken and whatever in his great history. We're actually in his garage. You are right? standing in his workshop at the moment <laughs> and just over your right shoulder is where he kept his stock of used sporting motor cars that he sold to his customers. And so this was Malcolm Campbell's headquarters and this is where those great land speed record cars were prepared. There was a company at the other end of the track, Thompson and Taylor, who did most of the actual manufacturing for him, but those cars were based here in the yeah. Campbell shed. We have to go back to the history of the track. I mean, bring that alive for us. Well, imagine a track. It's 100 feet wide in concrete, and it, as I said, it slopes up to 29 feet at the top of the bankings. Um, the outer circuit was two and three quarter miles round, and then there was an extra half mile finishing straight, again, because in horse racing, you have a finishing straight where all the horses come and finish up in front of the grandstands, <laughs> don't they? And that's what we had here. It was built of early, unreinforced concrete, uh, quite thin, only about six inches thick. So it always had massive problems with settling, yes. um, frost damage, all that sort of thing, because nobody knew what was gonna happen. Uh, they did put the first major pre-stressed concrete uh, structure in here when they were doing it. The bridge over the river way at the top was actually reinforced concrete, but everything else was just 
poured concrete and it didn't last. It got damaged almost from the beginning. So they were forever repairing it. And when you go around the track now, you can see all these <laughs> patches and so forth. Well, you can imagine the change having the track during the course of the race. Oh, yeah. yeah there, there were <laughs> the chunks punishment of, all the cars. Chunks there. of concrete yeah, you can uh, see that flying happening. around, lots of oh, dust, goodness. all that sort of thing. But it was a revelation. I mean, people had never seen this sort of thing going on before, where you sat in one place, the cars came around several times, you saw the cars travelling at these amazing speeds, because, of course, they're much faster on concrete than they were on the gravel roads sure. that, uh, <laughs> uh, that, that people had seen before that. So it really was groundbreaking stuff. And we're, we're looking at these pictures where the wheels are flying in the air. And that, that's like... right. I mean, the most famous photograph of motor racing in Brooklyn's all together is of the Napier Railton, the fastest car ever around here, with all four wheels off the ground on one of the big bumps, doing about 135 miles an hour. But out of all that, this became the fastest motor racing circuit, other than the Arvis Speedway in Germany towards the very end of uh, the 1930s. This is where the fastest races were going on. It really is amazing history. We've got to go for a break, folks. Don't go away without a lot more coming up right after this break. Help us appreciate how this part of the track was salvaged and saved. Somebody had to have the foresight to say, we have to save part of this. For this is such an important site. Yeah. How, how did that happen? Well, it, it all really started off with the great Bill Boddy, who's one of, one of the fantastic real motor racing journalists who worked here all the way through his career. Most of the time that Brooklyn's was running as a racetrack. Bill Boddy was here reporting on really, the racing. Really. And he was behind the formation of a Brooklyn Society, which really mm. just raised interest in trying to save part of the mm. track. So I help everybody appreciate where we are on the track. We're at the heart of uh, the headquarters end. So we have the we have the original motor racing clubhouse, which was the headquarters of the Brooklyn's Automobile Racing Club. We have these uh, buildings, which is where some of the significant racing drivers had their uh, had their headquarters. So we're at the northern end of the track, next door to the steepest part of the bankings. We also have around that, in about 30 acres in total of museum site, we have a lot of the buildings from the later aeroplane uh, factory uh, history of the site as well. Now the track unfortunately is not all together now. It's in the hands of a lot of different owners because it was, let, let's ex, ex, talk about the demise of the track really yeah. because uh, um, unfortunately there were some world wars going on. That, yeah, there were one or two minor <laughs> conflicts got on the road of motor racing. Uh, and what had happened, the, the, the critical thing was that even in the very early days of motor racing here, people realised that there's this wonderful big um, open ground that's about the size of Hyde Park in central London, so 350, 360 acres. It was a great place to go flying as well, because mm. there's a big flat field in the middle. And the aeroplane industry came here in a really big way, and they just moved in. They built hangars on top of the racetrack. They cut into the bankings yeah. to put in new things. They disguised it because they were worried about air raids. So they put all sorts of camouflage netting over it and dug big holes in the track. And eventually the track was really ruined. Thousands of aeroplanes built here during World War I. And then in the build up to World War II, the Vickers Company and the Hawker Company both started expanding their factories. Right. Those of you who've been reading the Peanuts cartoons for years know about Snoopy and the Red Baron and Sopwith Camels and all that sort of thing. <laughs> well, Sopwith Camels were built here at Brooklands during the First World War. And then later on, the Hawker Company built all sorts of amazing aeroplanes like the Hurricane. Vickers built the Wellington bomber here. Vast numbers of those aeroplanes. Then much later on, the Concord, a good portion of the Concorde yeah, was this actually was, built. The aircraft factory here became the headquarters of the British end of the Concorde project, which was an Anglo-French project, and about a third of the airframe of every Concorde built was built right here. And we're very fortunate. Uh, when they retired Concorde from flying, we acquired one of those Concords and we've, we took it apart, moved it 100 miles here, put it back together, and it's now the flagship <laughs> of our aviation collection. Wonderful cars here. Yeah, it's, oh, a music, it's a car museum. We should talk about the cars. Yeah, we should. Yeah, because <laughs> you have some amazing cars. Yeah, I mean, I mean we're standing right here. We're, uh, right behind you, we've got a lovely little uh, Wolseley that was purpose-built by the factory to race here in the light, lightest car class, 1,500cc, beautiful streamlined bodywork. That was built in 1922. We always have an Indy car here. We've got the Jim Robbins special yes, here at yes. the moment. So of course, Fabulous. this, was, this is where he worked. Yeah, yeah. So it's really good to see that here. Um, we've talked about the Napier Railton being 
driving that fantastic car. Next to the Napier Railton, we have a Duesenberg that started off wow. as a little sprint car in the States, was re-engined um, <laughs> with, with a Clemens straight eight to become a Grand Prix car. Out the back, we have another great restoration going at the moment with a 1912 Lorraine Dietrich Grand Prix car, which is just like a Blitz and Benz, 15 litre, four cylinder, chain driven motor car that's never really been restored. And we're just getting the engine back together <laughs> right now because it's a wonderful thing to have going. In addition to the cars, the bicycles, the motorcycles, and the airplanes, they're all fascinating. I mean, you, you really need to spend a full day here, plan, plan on a day experience because... Uh, it'll because keep you in addition to all those things, you've got the buildings, you have wonderful buildings like this one, you've got the concrete track itself, and people just go and stand on the track. A lot of people try <laughs> and climb to the top of the track, you know, because... And, and that's and about you, impossible. You, yeah, and you can just... <laughs> feel it. You can feel the ghosts of uh, people going past and realise just how steep it was and what an amazing engineering feat it was to build it. As we walk along there, you just imagine what it was like, but that's, that's where they were. That, that's exactly where they were. This is where motor racing was being formulated, you know, and, and everything was happening right here. Incredible. Um, Incredible. Incredible. <laughs> There's still enough track here. You can still get a pretty good run out of can't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 100 mile an hour down here in a rally car over the weekend. Is that right? Yeah. My goodness. Alan, thank you, thank you, thank you for helping our viewers see one of the great car guy venues in the world. I really need that. Well, thank it you for is. coming. <laughs> it is the Brooklyn's Museum. It is a must for everybody. You don't miss it when you come to London, all right? Back with more of our Car Crazy Friends in just a minute. SRT Coronado Speed Fest with Jerry Clark and a mighty cool, mighty fine Boss Leo 2 back here. Well, this car is kind of fun for me. I'll tell you, it's pretty outrageous. We have been, we just got back from a major trip through the East Coast. We did Lime Rock and... Did you really? Uh, and we did Watkins Glen. Wow. Yeah, we did Watkins Glen. You're like a professional Glen. driver, man. Oh, uh, no, this is my first year. I'm a rookie at this uh, Trans Am series. Now your wife, how does she get along with all this? She, she travels with you? Well, she actually started a, what we call the tag team. That's the Trans Am Girls team. It's a family affair. Yep, it is, absolutely. So, what do you think about Speed Fest here at Coronado? You know, this is really a great event. I'm particularly proud of the Navy and uh, Steve Earle and the way they put this thing together. It's really awesome. Not every car show has the awards on the on an aircraft here like the Ronald Reagan. Right? That's correct. Not too bad. That's you got bad. it, boy. Well, it's, a, it's a fun or what, hanging out with such cool people every week. What can you say? All these people are car crazy. They really are. Jerry, good luck to you out on the track. Okay. You're in a tough race. You're right. You're racing against Vic Edelbrock. I'm right in the middle and of the track. Cam. That Cammy's right next to me. So, know, right? <laughs> so there we go. Okay, so. good luck out there. We'll catch you with the camera. Okay. Take care. Take care. Let's find out how car crazy you are. 1932 was Ford's introduction of their fabulous Flathead V8. Flatheads, also called side valve engines by the British, ruled the streets as the most popular hot rod engine for over 20 years. In 1955, however, the venerable Flatty was dethroned by a new, lighter, and much more powerful V8. Who manufactured this new engine? Was it A, Cadillac, B, Studebaker, C, Chevrolet, or D, Chrysler? We'll find out right after this break, right here on Meguiar's Car Crazy. Let's find out how car crazy you are. 1932 was Ford's introduction of their fabulous Flathead V8. Flatheads, also called side valve engines by the British, ruled the streets as the most popular hot rod engine for over 20 years. In 1955, however, the venerable Flatty was dethroned by a new, lighter, and much more powerful V8. Who manufactured this new engine? Was it a. Cadillac, B. Studebaker, C. Chevrolet, or D. Chrysler? Hot Rodders began replacing the infamous Ford Flathead with the new more powerful Chevrolet Small Block in 1955. 
making it the V8 of choice for hot rods. And it's still going strong today, with over 90 million having been built over the last 53 years. And if you knew this small block of Chevy trivia, well, you must be car crazy. And now our host, Barry McGuire. I love your car crazy confessions because it seems like they are always so heartfelt as is this one from Dick Stobel from Manchester, Connecticut. I am building a 1932 Ford five window coupe, which has been a six year off and on process. We can understand that. Many folks these days have professionals complete their cars for them, but my coupe is a home built project. I've done all the work on it myself and I'm currently assembling it for paint. This is a garage project. Call me car crazy, but I am obsessed with this car. You should concentrate on the little guy working in his garage, like in the old days. I watch your show all the time. Keep up the good work. You seem like a very sincere person who really likes old cars and the people associated with them. Thanks, Dick Stobel. Well, thank you, Dick, for your letter and for your kind remarks. I do love old cars and I love the people who love them, regardless of whether they're garage project car guys like yourself or custodians of priceless classics that require the highest level of restoration expertise so that we can experience the craftsmanship of these magnificent cars exactly as they were originally produced 70 or 80 years ago. Car guys come in all flavors, and a car guy is not any less of a car guy if he's not good with his hands or things mechanical, or he simply doesn't have the luxury of free time. Having said that, however, I want to quickly point out that most car guys are hands-on with their cars, and after 40 years of car shows, I see the hobby as a pyramid with the owners of world-class cars impeccably restored by gifted artisans at the very top of the pyramid with increasing numbers of car guys as you move downscale to the garage project car guys like yourself who represent the largest segment of the car hobby. So Dick, you're speaking for more than half of our television audience by drawing our attention to what you call the little guy working in his garage. And I have great love and affection for you and for what you represent. And that's why we interview so many of your soulmates at the events we attend. Clearly your hands-on obsession for your 32 five window coupe is contagious. And that's why you made all of us just a little bit more car crazy. We're at car shows all over the country every weekend and get lots of car care questions such as what will remove scratches and swirls? Where can I get your hard to find products? Which Meguiar's products are best for my car? That's why we introduced an all new web store, MeguiarsDirect.com. Information on hundreds of our products along with videos and tips that will give you that show car shine. Every item we make can be ordered online and shipped to you within 24 hours. All of the Meguiar's products direct to you fast. Check out MeguiarsDirect.com.